lifeless, sucking the joy out of life, pounding our chests in a constant state of penitence. We should never be existing, exiting worship in a state of depression. What we should be is exuberant, bursting with joy, the joy of knowing the God, the one true God that loves us. In order to be the salt of the earth, Christians must bring flavor to the world. We must bring the radiance of the Christian faith. Christians should be people full of life, celebrating and sharing the joy that we know in Christ Jesus. Now, here is where in the text we come to something that is quite head-scratching. Because Jesus goes on to say, when salt loses its flavor, it cannot be restored and is no longer good for anything except being thrown out and trodden underfoot. This, this is difficult to understand, especially since salt never really loses its taste. What, what did Jesus mean here? Especially since we would like to think that even after we fail, and give in to our weaknesses, that we will be forgiven and restored through the grace of God's good mercy. Why would Jesus say that there might be a time when salt, when as salt, we would lose our flavor, our usefulness? I can only think that it is a time at which we decide to turn away, when we decide to no longer flavor to the world. That is to bring a zest for living because we know that God is good and that God indeed loves us. But when we no longer desire to represent the purity of the Christian faith, when we no longer desire to hold the line against the sinful nature of this world and succumb to its temptations, when we reach that we are no longer useful. I, I don't know where else to go with this phrasing from Jesus. But then, I remember that it is the risen Lord who is speaking these words of warning. And I remember he died for our sins, our failures, our poor decisions, so that we could rise again to a new life in him. So I don't know. Perhaps it is when we are lost and he is searching to find us anew, that we are revitalized and made useful again to be salt. I guess the lesson here might be not to lose our usefulness as salt in the first place. But even if we do, we have Jesus to give us new life and new flavor. So now, let's look at light and being the light of the world. When Jesus was with us on earth, he said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But, knowing that he would be leaving this world, he tells us that you, you are the light of this world. Jesus is telling us, we might even say commanding us, his followers, to be his light in this world. He demands nothing less of us than we should reflect his light in this world. The Jews hearing Matthew's good news would have understood this imagery. The Jews of the time referred to Jerusalem as the light to the Gentiles. The way that the Jews understood and used this expression will give us understanding as to how Jesus was using it. The Jews understood that his real was to be the light to the Gentiles, but they also understood it was God's lamp. This light that shone from the nation was a borrowed light. It was the light that God had lit. So it should be the same with we Christians. The light that Jesus demands that we are to shine out into the world is not a light that we can generate 
ourselves. It is a reflection of His light. The radiance that we are to show is from the presence of the Christ within us. And it should burst forth from us like the rising of the sun on a new horizon. Why do I use that imagery? It is because the light of Christ within us is meant to be seen. The joy that we know in Jesus and the Father is a joy that is meant to be shared and not held for ourselves. So too our Christianity is meant to be seen. Someone once said, there is, there can be no such a thing as secret discipleship. Either the secrecy destroys the discipleship or the discipleship destroys the secrecy. Our Christianity should be absolutely and completely visible for all to see. What that means is that we should not only be visible while we are in the confines of our church. If our Christianity stops at the doors when we leave here, then it is no use to anyone. Remember, the salt that loses its taste, our Christianity should be <coughs> visible while we stand online to order coffee. It should be visible when we order a meal at a restaurant. It should be visible in how we act at work, the way we drive on the road, the language that we use each day, especially when we're on the road. We should be the same Christians in our workspace, or any space for that matter, as we are within these walls. Jesus did not say, you are a light to the church. He said, you are a light to the world. Our Christianity needs to be evident to all. And James might say, it is our works that make our faith visible. <clears throat> Another way that we use light in this world is to be a guiding light like a lighthouse guiding ships to safe harbor. We are that guiding light too. We are to guide people that we come in contact with to the focal point of the goodness we know that is the God of love and mercy. We are to guide them to the safe surety of God's truth. Similarly, we are to make the light of Christ visible when we know that people are running themselves towards danger, when people that we know and love are setting themselves up on a destructive course. And you know that so much of this world and what it offers will push us away from knowing a relationship with God. We need to stop and cry out with love, this is wrong. This will only hurt you. And then we become that guiding light that brings them back to safe harbor. The Bible scholar, William Barclay, sums up the light in this way. The light which can be seen, the light which warns, the light which guides, these are the lights a Christian must be. My friends, this is a passage of Jesus' teachings that challenges us like no other. It may not be as clear as the Great Commission to go out and make disciples and baptize. This passage challenges us to be forever the loving extension of Jesus himself on earth. We are to reflect His light, His pure love. We are to be the guiding light that prevents the world from putrefaction and corruption. We are to be the light that explodes onto the world like a sunrise bringing zest and flavor that comes from knowing the love that God has for us. 
My friends, it is clear without a doubt that we need Savior. Jesus has found us and has offered us God's saving grace. The one thing that he asks for of us is that we share it by being the salt that brings joy to the world and by being the light that guides the world to that joy. At this moment, let us confirm our faith by reciting the, or praying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God Almighty, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seen at the right hand of God. He will come again as a judge to the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. concerns I would like to share them with you and uh, the ones that are joys I would like us all to respond thanks be to God and for the ones that are prayers for healing or for just concerns that people have I would like us all to respond Lord hear our prayer so the first one is for Kenny celebrating his 44th birthday. Kenny, here now? No? So for Kenny, thank you, God. We have just prayers that are, are being asked for, for for Jonathan, for Laura, for Lori, Walter, Charles, Bonnie Sue, Ann, Taylor, Naoma, Keith, Pam, Helen, Evelyn and friend Kat, Nadia, Barbara. They're not, they're not saying, I mean, are, are there reasons for these prayers that we can share with one another? Well, Father, what was that? For healing. Father God, these are your children in need of, of your loving touch, in, in need of being held close to your breast, and, and to know that in your grasp they will find healing, both of heart, of soul, and of body. And, and we ask that you, you look down on them and, and you hold them and caress them and, and let them know that they are loved. And, and Lord, hear our prayer. And then we have for Rob, Celia, Amanda and the girls, Mark and Kathy. Are there any specific reasons for these prayers? Well, Father, these, these are people whose names, whose, who are on our hearts. And, and we bring them to you, Father, just because we want you to know and love them. And we want them to know that they are loved. And we want you to, to bring your joy, to bring your mercy and your caring up upon them. And, and Lord, we ask, hear our prayer. So Father, we come to you and, and we pray the prayer that, that Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Luke tells us, on the day of Jesus' resurrection, two of his disciples were walking along the road back home to Emmaus. And they were returning from the pilgrimage, their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And they were discussing between themselves all the things that had transpired that week in Jerusalem. And while they were walking along the road and talking, Jesus himself, came and walked among them. And he asked them, what is it that you're discussing? And they responded, are you the only one in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there? The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, <clears throat> who was a mighty prophet before God, and how the chief priests had him handed over and had him crucified. And then Jesus walked with them and explain why it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory. He began with Moses and explained all the prophets and interpreted everything for them about himself. And as they approached their village, they urged him to stay with them for dinner. So he entered their home and he sat at their table. And when he was at the table, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. My friends, let us pray that as we come to this table, that our eyes will be opened to see the risen Lord. My friends, this is the Lord's table. It is not a Presbyterian table or one belonging to any denomination or faith. Jesus recognizes and welcomes all who believe in him to come to this table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is hard right to give our thanks and praise. You are holy, God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch, and he was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice, and he was mocked and despised him. He came with peace in his heart, and he was met with violence and death. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread, and after giving thanks to you, broke it. And he said, take, eat, and when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, poured it out, and said to them, this is the cup of my blood, the new covenant. When you drink of it, drink it in remembrance of me.
Jesus had done this with his disciples, he said to them, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. My friends, this is a foretelling of our promised place in the kingdom of God. When Jesus will greet us in his glory, let us rejoice in the promise of the word of God. God, we take this bread and the fruit of this vine from the gifts that you have given us, that we celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this as a sacrifice, accept this as our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Friends, now is the time when we can share the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Those at church last week were able to wave to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> now is the time generosity when we can bring our tithes and our gifts uh, to the Lord. So ascribe to the Lord and bring honor and gifts to his name. 